Mm. Euh, on entend un petit peu. Oui. Que les profs qui sont un peu du sont en train de parler tout seul. Ok, je pense que c'est un. Voilà, il y a tellement d'interférences. On va voir un écho depuis. Monsieur, il faut couper le son um, sur oh. votre, vos uh, ordinateurs pour éviter le Merci. feedback. Um, ok. Uh, Est-ce que tout le monde peut me entendre? Peut-être vous pouvez... Uh, Um, moi, vous avez un uh, chat. Ah, je, je vous entends. Très bien. Je, je, je vais uh, partager l'écran. Um, uh, attendez. Uh, uh, oui, OK. Est-ce que vous voyez le, le crin ici? Bonjour. Allô? Um, très bien. Uh, remote option. Uh, participant J5. Start video. Um, et uh, est-ce est que vous pouvez m'entendre? Pardon? Oui. oui, très bien. Ok, je, je vais... Uh, il y a cinq dans le cell? Je, je vais commencer. Si vous avez des questions, essayez de... Uh, uh, Parlez fort et je, je, vais, uh, uh, je vais essayer de répondre. Um, OK. So, uh, désolé pour le, le, le retard ce matin. J'avais des problèmes avec la voiture. Et donc, uh, comme j'ai prévu de faire le cours à distance, en tout cas, à partir de la semaine prochaine, j'ai pensé que je, je vais essayer uh, ce matin. So, c'est le cours d'astrophysique, cosmologie, les deux, mais c'est coupé en deux parties. Monsieur Legrand, il fait la partie astrophysique uh, non relativiste. Moi, je fais la partie uh, relativiste avec la gravitation, ça veut dire la relativité générale et finalement la cosmologie. Uh, J'imagine... J'imagine que vous... Vous avez, honte, euh, 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 vous avez envie de, de commencer la cosmologie tout de suite, mais il faut, um, pour, pour comprendre l'expansion de l'univers, il faut comprendre la relativité générale, la théorie de la gravitation d'Einstein. Donc, euh, on va commencer avec une, une base. Euh, 
sur la relativité générale et après on va aborder la cosmologie. C'est toujours intéressant la relativité générale, on va uh, étudier tout d'abord les, les trous noirs. So, C'est un phénomène uh, important de l'astrophysique. So, ce n'est pas une, une uh, séparation stricte entre l'astrophysique uh, et, um, et, et la partie de, or mon par, ma partie de cours. C'est plutôt une distinction entre la, la partie uh, non relativiste de M. Legrand et la partie relativiste de moi. OK. So, aujourd'hui, um, je vais vous donner, je, je vais uh, commencer avec les renseignements pratiques, le fonctionnement de cours, uh, parce que c'est différent uh, cette année avec l'épidémie. Uh, J'ai prévu de faire le cours à distance. Um, comme ça, uh, on est prêt si le, le, le pandémie devient plus uh, pire. Je vais introduire le, la relativité générale, juste vous donner une idée c'est quoi la relativité générale. On commence quand même avec les nouveaux concepts de la relativité restreinte, qui est, qui est la base de la relativité générale. Les outils de la relativité restreinte la géométrie de Newton, le, les, um, les notions de la transformation de Galilée le, et la distinction entre la transformation de Galilée et la transformation de Lorentz. On, on va discuter d'une façon uh, intuitive la géométrie lo, Lorentzienne Or Minkowskian, c'est la même chose, juste deux mots pour la, pour la même chose. C'est la géométrie de l'espace-temps en relativité restreinte. Je vais vous offrir des cours à distance. Euh, J'ai prévu à partir de la semaine prochaine. Um, J'ai créé uh, un blog pour le cours. Je suis en train de faire ce blog. Um, Uh, ça c'est le lien pour le blog uh, je, je vais vous envoyer ça comme uh, un uh, email comme ça vous pouvez uh, cliquer sur le lien Et, uh, mais je vais faire ça cet après-midi uh, après je, que j'ai ajouté des choses le, je pense que le blog va être intéressant pour vous parce qu'on peut poser les questions comme les commentaires je vous, et, Um, il y aura les liens sur les supports, vous pouvez poser la question, je vais répondre sur le blog, mais c'est intéressant parce que tout le monde uh, peut lire les, les questions et réponses. Um, cette année, parce que, surtout parce que c'est un peu différent, ou très différent, le, le fonctionnement de cours cette année. Je, je, veux, um, je veux assurer le fait que vous suivez le cours de les débuts. Donc, il y aura un uh, contrôle continu uh, chaque semaine. Ce n'est pas un gros contrôle continu, c'est juste un tout petit pas du contrôle continu, mais ça, ça va être fait uh, chaque semaine. Je vais vous aider pendant les uh, TD. So, je vais couper le créneau de deux heures en deux parties. La première partie va être un, le cours magistral, la deuxième partie le, le TD. Um, il y a des livres pour le cours que je vous uh, conseille d'utiliser. Um, 
il y a le père de livre Bar Schutz et, et moi-même. Et il y a le livre de Hobson et Bajo et Klein. Tous les, les Hobson et Bajo Klein sont dans la bibliothèque et ils sont en français. Mais Schutz et, et mon livre sont en, en anglais. Uh, normalement, je, je veux vous uh, offrir des, uh, le prêt des livres de Schutz et, et moi. J'ai plusieurs exemplaires dans mon bureau. M'envoyez un mail si, vous, si ça vous intéresse de prêter une version de, de, de paire de livres Schutz et, et moi. Juste plus généralement, je vous conseille de jeter un coup d'œil sur ce dictionnaire de physique qui ça va vous servir dans toute la carrière en physique et les autres cours en physique aussi. OK. Je veux juste vérifier que vous pouvez voir les, les crains comme moi. Vous, vo vous voyez les di diaporamas comme moi? Uh, how can I... Uh, how can I verify that? Damn it. Uh, um, uh, attendez, s'il vous plaît, je, je veux juste vérifier uh, les, les crains que vous voyez et um, je suis un peu nouveau avec le Zoom. Parce que j'ai pensé de faire ça la semaine prochaine. Uh, je vais quitter Skip. Uh, ok, je vais juste cliquer là et espérer que ça vous voyez mon écran. Um, J'ai perdu mon, uh, fenêtre, ma fenêtre. Ah oui, c'est là. Ok. Ok. Est-ce que quelqu'un peut répondre à moi, s'il vous plaît, à haute voix? Et vous voyez maintenant les diaporamas? Comment? Vous voyez pas? On, on vous a écrit, monsieur. On a écrit des messages. Um, oui, mais je ne le vois pas. Uh, dans, les trois petits, dans les trois petits points, monsieur. Dans les trois petits points. Uh, Il okay. faut cliquer et il y a discussion. Ah oui, 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 chat. Ok, oui, 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 vous pouvez faire le cours en anglais, s'il vous plaît. Est-ce que, est que tout le monde est d'accord que je, je fais le cours euh, en anglais? On est d'accord, on est d'accord. Oui. Yes? Ok. Ok, je, je, I'll, uh, I'll speak uh, in English from now on. And, um, And, and so I'll return to the uh, diaporamas here and uh, uh, let me get the darn chat thing out of the way. Okay, um, great.
so you see this slide. Uh, inter so we're at uh, introduction to general relativity, which in which in English is GR. I imagine it's RG uh, is the thing in French. So it's a theory about gravitation. It re it replaces, in some sense, Newton's theory. It replaces in the sense that it's more general. So it approaches Newton's theory in the limit of a weak gravitational field and small uh, velocities between the bodies, the gravitating bodies. <clears throat> so remember that Newton's theory tells, uh, Newton's theory of gravity tells us that if we have a mass m that produces a gravitational field, say phi, and the gravitational field is given by this formula here, if, if the mass is a, is a point particle, and r is the distance from this point particle. And of course, g0, g0 is uh, Newton. Um, Monsieur? Yes? Uh, en fait, on voit pas le diapo, mais on voit votre page HTML. Oh, mess. Um, uh, oh, I think I know why. Okay, I'm going to... Peut-être qu'il a frisé. I'm going to, uh, it's because I chose the wrong one. Is that better? Uh, yes. uh, perfect. Great. Okay. Okay. So, uh, now we see this formula with phi and the, uh, the, the gravitational potential and the uh, uh, Newton's constant. The, I've written little g as a vector. It's the force per unit mass given by minus the gradient of the scalar potential phi. And in this simple case of a point particle of mass m, you can, you can take that gradient, it's only in the radial direction, and that gives you a uh, force per unit mass uh, consistent with, uh, you know, the, the, the well, this, this formula here. Because little vector g is the acceleration or the force per unit mass, it's also the acceleration given Newton's uh, first law or second law of motion. If, uh, if, little, if, the, if the only force acting on the particle is the gravitational force. Of course, the acceleration would be different if we had electromagnetic or nuclear forces on it, but uh, let's imagine it's just gravity. So this is uh, hopefully a reminder for you. We covered this in an abstract way in the math class last year, but uh, hopefully you've seen it in, uh, in your mechanics classes. Um, there has been problems with that in, the, in other years, so it's not guaranteed that you've seen that, but at least you've seen it in the mathematics class. The key point I want to make is that this is, uh, it, it's a mathematical point. It, it's the fact that you're, um, we're, we're, we're expressing this as a vector equation. Vector, vectors are quite useful because it, it, you can summarize these relations independent of the orientation of the coordinate system. If I change the, if I rotated the x and y axes about the z axis, the same vector equation would apply. That's one of the strong reasons for using vectors. However, 
we're going to replace that Newtonian law with the one that you see here in equation two, which is a tensor equation. So these quantities with indices alpha, beta, the Greek letters alpha and beta are what we call indices. And because there's two of them, it means we have rank two tensors. And this equation is actually Einstein's field equation. It's the equation which replaces that earlier equation, equation one with the, uh, um, with the gravitational force. So it tells us what the, in a sense, what the gravitational field is for a given mass and energy distribution. The mass and energy distribution is, is contained in this quantity called the, um, the stress energy tensor or the energy, you, it has various names. You could call it the energy momentum tensor. And that looks like what I've translated uh, into French here. Or the authors of the book that I was using when I prepared this, uh, you called it the tensor energy impulsion. So, but, but its symbol is T alpha beta. So it's a second rank tensor. Now I recognize you haven't seen uh, tensors up till now or only briefly probably in your uh, physics education. So a big part of our time is, is going to be just explaining what we mean by these tensors. Uh, in fact, we have three tensors in this equation too. We have the tensor R alpha beta. We have another tensor little g alpha beta, and then the capital T alpha beta. The one I was just talking about, the stress energy tensor. Um, the R, the big, the big R here is just a constant and the kappa here is a constant. Um, so the most important tensor for us is actually going to be this little GAB. It's what we call the metric tensor. You might have seen the metric tensor or you almost certainly have seen the metric tensor, but you might not have called it the metric tensor. Because we, as instructors, we like to avoid uh, uh, complicating your lives with, with new terminology and new information if it's not strictly necessary at the time. That's kind of a strategy in, in, in education. And, and, and so you, you've almost certainly seen this metric tensor, but no one's probably told you that it was a metric tensor. Anyways, in this class, it's essential that you understand uh, the metric tensor. That's my, my first job is to make you appreciate what tensors are and in particular this metric tensor. Um, but before I can do that, I really have to uh, explain uh, the basics of special relativity. Un unfortunately, each year we, we seem to have less uh, special relativity taught in the physics program before the third year, and so I have to review more and more the special relativity. Um, it, it's, it's, it really is related to general relativity because it, special relativity is just a, a special case of general relativity. It's just relativity in flat space-time, if you like. It's when all the curvature uh, becomes zero in general relativity, then you then you're you have the special relativity case. So to understand this general relativity, we really need a firm, solid understanding of special relativity. So the acronym, I guess, is RR uh, in French. In 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 uh, English, or at least North American English, we always uh, say SR for special relativity and GR for general relativity. So special relativity is a simple theory. Uh, all the results um, follow from uh, three basic principles. These are not logically independent, actually. I, th I think 
you could reduce it even to uh, one basic principle. But, uh, but, but, but that complicates the presentation and I don't see any point in doing that. Uh, so it's quite standard to present it in terms of uh, two, two the first two principles and then to sneak in the third one about homogeneity and isotropy of space-time uh, as kind of just a thing that you're supposed to obviously know and, and not count it as a, as a separate principle. But, but uh, for a clear presentation, I think we should say that there are th these three basic principles and um, I, I just want to, before I explain it, I just want to say that although this, the theory is simple in the sense that I'm presenting it, uh, it the, the mathematics is simple. It follows from these three uh, short uh, principles that I can uh, spell out quite quickly. It doesn't mean that it's simple to understand special relativity and in, in fact it, it's it's uh it's quite difficult because it's because it's very subtle the the notions involved are, are very subtle and it's counterintuitive and it's it's a it's a great leap of abstraction to to understand special relativity so i don't mean to imply that it should be easy to understand it. I just mean it's a simple theory in the sense that, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's much simpler than organic chemistry or molecular biology or something like that. Uh, it, it doesn't mean it's, it's easy to understand. But, but, but that's why we're in physics, right? Because we love this stuff and, and uh, so we're gonna apply ourselves. Um, the, the first principle is the principle of relativity. This is not new. Uh, it's not new to you, and it's not new. It wasn't new to Einstein, right? He, he um, it's Galilean relativity, the, the same idea uh, that Galileo and Newton had. It basically, in sort of modern terminology, it means that there's a category of reference frame that are special, uh, that, that cause the, the equations of motion to, to simplify. And uh, so we call those reference frames inertial. It's, it's only different from Galilean relativity in the sense that Galileo didn't know about electricity and magnetism, or he didn't know the Max, you know, Maxwell's laws. So, so really what Einstein did here was he, he said, let's take the principle of relativ Galilean relativity quite seriously and just extend it to, to include uh, Maxwell's laws. And once you do that, uh, you run into this bizarre problem that it only really makes sense if then the velocity of light becomes uh, independent of reference frame. And that's in fact the, the second principle here. And, and that's, I guess in essence, why it's not really logically distinct, but it, it's nice to just state it quite clearly that we're gonna assume that the velocity of light in vacuum, of course, is uh, equal to a constant, regardless of the inertial reference frame. Uh, I, I, I just said independent of reference frame here, but, uh, but the implication is we're always using inertial reference frame. You can actually, just to be clear, you can include non-inertial reference frames, but it it uh, it takes a lot of care, and um, so we're going to just uh, keep life simple and use inertial reference frames. Then our velocity of light equals a constant. We all set it to the same symbol, uh, C, the letter C, the small uh, lowercase uh, letter C. Okay, and then uh, it uh, is necessary to assume or include the fact that space and time 
In fact, space-time is one entity and it's homogeneous and isotropic. Isotropic, remember, means that there's no special direction. The space-time looks the same in all directions at, at some sort of fundamental uh, level. And uh, it's homogeneous. There's no special location in, in space-time. It's the same everywhere. Okay, so I said it's a simple theory, but obviously this principle number two is, is really counterintuitive. It, 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 it takes a, a little reflection to even appreciate that how strange it is, right? It's if you could imagine going half the speed of light in the direction of some light beam, and if you could measure the velocity of that light beam with respect to you, you would see the light going away from you at the speed of light because you'd be in this inertial reference frame and the velocity of light is always the same and and, and uh in, in an inertial reference frame so then if you doubled your speed again so you're going twice as fast now uh still in the same uh direction trying to catch up to some light beam you would still measure that light beam receding away from you at the speed c. So it's really quite counterintuitive. Another impl implication is that the notion of Euclidean space in three dimensions at a given instant in time doesn't have an absolute sense. And that's because the notion of an, there, there's no absolute time in the sense uh, that Newton thought there was. Newton thought very deeply about the notion of time and he decided that there was this, uh, what we now call Newtonian time, just absolute time. It, uh, it is the same in all reference frames. Well, it's, it's not, it's one of those reference frame dependent things, just like our coordinates in space are. So it's uh, useful to, to uh, recall some uh, elements of um, special relativity uh, of Euclidean geometry here, sorry. And so in Euclidean space in three dimensions, we'd measure the distance between two points. The distance delta L is given by this formula here. It just follows from Pythagorean's theorem, right? I, I guess applied uh, twice to, to get uh, the, the distance uh, squared is, is the increment in the, in the x coordinate squared plus the increment in y coordinate squared plus the increment in z coordinate squared. We can define a quantity in special relativity which does have an absolute meaning. It's independent of reference frame by constructing the following uh, quantity. We're, we're gonna call it the interval of special relativity and it's delta S and it's always written in this uh, quadratic form here. Delta S squared is given by the temporal increment. So delta T is the is the increment in the time coordinates between these two events. We're talking about events in, in four-dimensional space-time now. So there's an increment in the spatial coordinates, delta x, delta y, and delta z, but there's also an increment in the time coordinate. T is our time coordinate, so delta t is our increment in time coordinate between these two events. I'm gonna call them events instead of points because they're points in space. We're talking about two different points in space that occur potentially at two different times. So we have an increment in time and in, in uh, spatial coordinates. So we have delta T squared 
but it wouldn't make sense to add these if 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 we didn't uh like time has units of time and and delta x has units of of space etc so to to add these together we have to multiply the time increment by the speed of light uh, squared that gives us this quantity of fundamental interest the increment in uh the increment of or the interval of special relativity squared it's a fundamental interest because it's independent of inertial reference frame Okay, the next point is that the, the velocity of the speed of light in the vacuum is a result of the equations of electromagnetism, Maxwell's equations, right? If you write down Maxwell's equations in a vacuum, they simplify to a, uh, a wave equation and they, the, with a single parameter in there, which is the which can be written as the as the phase speed of the waves <clears throat> and that gives us the the speed of light but those equations are valid in any inertial reference frame and they always give the same constant. So if the Galilean relativity also applies to phenomena in electricity and magnetism, then Maxwell's equation should be invariant and therefore this speed of light should be the same in all reference frames. That's really the, what I just said uh, that fact uh, explains why these two principles are not logically independent. Okay. Let's consider some uh, the t of the tools that are used in, rel in uh, special relativity. So um, we, we, I, I want to describe what's called the uh, standard configuration of reference frames. I, I remember explaining this uh, in detail to you last year, but we'll uh, in uh, the special relativity class, but uh, We'll um, go over that again. Uh, so we have uh, uh, t two inertial observers that are in relative motion with respect to each other at a constant velocity v. So if one of them's an inertial observer and the other one's moving at a constant velocity with respect to, to him, then uh, the second one is an inertial observer as well. Let's give the two reference frames uh, different names. Let's call them S and S prime. And let's assume I've called them uh, reference, uh, Cartesian reference frames. So we're gonna use uh, Cartesian coordinates in S and S prime. And, and we'll just give them the labels uh, X, Y, and Z as is quite standard. Obviously that applies to S and X prime, Y prime, Z prime for the other reference frame. Now I want to get a little bit more specific about how we, of course, we have a choice of uh, how we orient our axes and let's just to keep uh, things simple, let's orient the X axis uh, and the X prime axis in the same direction and put them in the direction of relative movement between the two observers. So the X axis is, is and X prime axis are, they're the special ones in a sense. The relative motion is, is along them. And the X, or sorry, the Y and the Z axes and Y prime and Z prime are, um, the, are orthogonal to the relative motion then. And of course, we're gonna line up Y prime with Y and Z prime with Z. 
Furthermore, we, we, our description is not complete, right? Because we, we now have a temporal coordinate, a time coordinate, T and T prime, and they are in general not equal. That's the surprising thing, uh, or counterintuitive thing, I should say. Uh, it should not be a surprise because we're treating space and time in some senses on equal footing, we like to say. That, that means time is, behaves a lot like space in, in special relativity. There's no logical uh, uh, distinction between uh, a lot of the properties of, of uh, space and time. So we have to describe our time coordinate and we're going to choose our time coordinate such that T equals T prime at the, at the origin at T equals zero. So in, in Newtonian physics, we would relate the coordinates in uh, the two reference frames just using a Galilean transformation. And it's pretty easy to convince yourself that if the S prime coordinate system is moving to the right along the X axis, so the origin uh, x prime equals zero is moving to the right along the x-axis at a speed v, then, then the x prime coordinate will be given by this equation here, v minus, or sorry, x minus v times t. That's because we want the location of x prime equal to zero to constantly be getting to bigger values of x as time gets bigger. And when t equals zero, then uh, the, the origins correspond. So in other words, x equals zero corresponds to x prime equal to zero. The, the, and the y prime and the z prime uh, would just equal y and z because the relative motion is along the x-axis. Uh, you could call this Newtonian geometry, if you like, because it implies uh, uh, absolute time. The, the time does not depend on the reference frame here. And uh, we only have the coordinates affected in, in the direction of uh, motion here the spatial coordinates. Um, but uh, that transfer, that Galilean transformation is going to be replaced by the Lorentz transformation in special relativity. In special relativity, the time itself transform, the temporal coordinate time T uh, is going to transform along with the, the spatial coordinates. And in fact, here's the Lorentz transformation for that uh, standard configuration that I just described. And now the time coordinate T has always been multiplied by the, le by the letter C, the speed of light, so that the CT, you could think of C times T as, as a new coordinate. It would have then the same units as, uh, or same dimensions as the spatial coordinates, X, Y, and Z, right? Because it would be just distance, have units of distance. Um, so in this formula for the Lorentz transformation, you have two parameters. There's the Greek letter gamma and the Greek letter beta. And the rest are just our coordinates here. And the coordinates in the, the four coordinates describing events in 
space-time as described by the S prime coordinate system are related to the, the uh, coordinates in space-time with respect to the S uh, reference frame on the right. So again, the, the Y, if there's relative motion only along the X axis, the Y and the Z are unaffected. Of course, this X coordinate is affected, but uh, also the time coordinate is too. And uh, so, so what are these parameters? Uh, beta is the velocity between the two reference frames in units of the speed of light. So in other words, V normalized by C. So beta can take values up to uh, plus one, right? Or it has to be less than plus one because this V has to be less than C. What's the minimum value? It's not zero, it's minus one because you could have relative, you could imagine the origin of the S prime coordinate system could be moving to the left along the X axis, right? That's allowed. It's just a change in direction of the motion. And, uh, but, but, uh, so, but it has, the, its magnitude still has to be less than the speed of light. So the, the range of values of beta is between minus one and, and plus one. And gamma is, Another parameter also depends on beta. It's just a function of beta. And it has a name. It, this gamma keeps coming up in special relativity. And it's called the Lorentz factor after the, the, physis, the physicist Lorentz, Dutch uh, physicist. Um, so just, I want to make a little, com a little more commentary on this, uh, Lorentz transformation. You could say that this transformation implies a Lorentzian geometry. It's really a statement about the geometry of space time in four dimensions. And the interesting thing of, of course, the most fundamental thing is that there's, we've lost the notion of absolute time because the time coordinate is, is transforming under this uh, reference, uh, change in reference frame. How does it change? Well, it's interesting to notice the symmetry between the, the way uh, the coordinates C times T and, and X transform, they, 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 in this Lorentz transformation, this isn't the only Lorentz transformation, right? You could, you could have, uh, you could have a, a non-standard uh, movement between the coordinate systems. I mean, it could be as simple as having the, 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 the origin of the S prime moving at constant velocity along the Y axis. Um, you could imagine rotating the, the coordinate systems. You, you could uh, but do all kinds of uh, different uh, transformations, which still count as a Lorentz transformation. But uh, in, in, in other words, it, it, the Lorentz transformations form a group of mathematic uh, of uh, transformation. So for, for those of you in the, in the uh, reinforced math uh, option, you'll, you'll know about groups and, and, and you could say that uh, it's a mathematical group, the algebraic object. Um, that, that's the sense of the term. For those of you who don't know about mathematical groups, uh, it, it, it's not uh, essential that you understand that, just that know that there are many different Lorentz transformations. And um, that I'm just giving you uh, the one that applies here in equation six for, for this standard configuration.
and, and I'd like to just emphasize this symmetry between the uh, transformation. Uh, I was trying to say that uh, the way CT transforms under this equation six and the way X transforms is there's a strong uh, parallel. I, I'm not sure the right words for it, but other than just to ask you to, to look at it. Uh, so, so here we have uh, CT gets multiplied by gamma in the CT equation or the CT prime equation. And in the X prime equation, we have the X gets uh, multiplied by gamma. Um, in the CT prime equation, we have sort of the other coordinate, which is the X gets multiplied by not gamma, but minus beta gamma times X. And then, uh, so in the X prime coordinate or X, yeah, for the X prime coordinate, we have the other coordinate is, is time. And uh, so CT gets multiplied by the other thing, which is minus beta gamma. Uh, so there, there's a strong uh, symmetry in, in, this, uh, in this pair of equations. And um, so that's, uh, that gives us a hint already that space and time uh, behave in, uh, in a similar way in special relativity. And of course, we know that the Galilean transformation uh, is a very good approximation. It worked for hundreds of years before anyone noticed any problems with it. So we expect that we should be able to recover the Galilean transformation in some kind of limit from the Lorentz transformation. And the limit is simply that the uh, magnitude of the velocity V, remember that's the velocity between the two reference frames, has to be, or when that becomes much less than the speed of light, beta approaches zero because beta is simply V over C. Uh, so we're saying when that gets small, close to zero, Gamma will approach one. And then you recover the, uh, the Lorentz or Galilean transformation. Uh, so gamma goes to one and beta goes to zero. So this term drops out and you just have that uh, CT prime equals CT. So the C's cancel and T prime equals T, just like Newton thought. And um, here in this we equation, we'd have, we have to be a little bit careful. Uh, beta, don't set it equal to zero, set it equal to V over C, and then cancel that C with the C in the denominator here. So you'd have minus V, gamma, you can say that approaches one. So it's minus VT as we had in the, uh, 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 Lorenz, uh, sorry, Galilean transformation and gamma approaches one. So we recover the um, uh, Galilean uh, transformation under the, the limit of, of small uh, velocities. Um, as you would expect. Now I want to try and uh, I don't have time to do this in a rigorous way, but uh, I want to at least uh, remind you of the key results of special relativity that we, we saw last year. And they really follow just from this Lorentz transformation. With the Lorentz transformation, you can derive the, the principal results of special relativity, namely the um, time dilation, length correct, contraction, and <clears throat> um, well, those are the two uh, principal results. You can also get that the, um, the, the, uh, the, the link between mass and energy, but it's, it's a little bit more work. Um, okay.
I, I've been emphasizing that that the 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 c times t, the the time axis when when it multiplied by the speed of light, becomes like a space axis, and the two behave uh, very similarly. What this implies is that we can work in in a structure called space time, where t t time and and space are just different aspects of the same structure. They're like two faces of the same coin, if you like. I say that alors il y a des raccourcis dans l'espace. So, and so we expect that there should be shortcuts in space time. And uh, that's quite a leap of uh, a logical leap there, but uh, that's one of the subtleties of, of special relativity. If you think of uh, two points in the Euclidean plane, so we're just in the case of, uh, of working in, in a two-dimensional space, just to simplify things. You could say, well, I have X and Y coordinates. And if I considered two points in that um, two-dimensional space, the, the, the shortest distance between those two points is a straight line between them. But there are many other paths between those two points. And those different paths in general will have different distances between the two points. It's such an obvious point that we hardly ever mention it, but it, 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 it's important here in, in a subtle way because now we're saying that we don't just have two-dimensional space, we don't just have three-dimensional space, we have four-dimensional space-time. So if I consider two events in this four-dimensional space-time, they'll have a, an increment in their temporal coordinates, their time coordinates, and their, uh, an increment in their spatial coordinates. And the uh, sort of distance between these two events, it's a sort of generalized distance now, right? Because it's not just the spatial distance, but it includes some time part or temporal part. And, but we, to find that uh, generalized distance between these two events in space-time, we have to think carefully about what path we took between those events. As in the, as we just, the simple case we considered in the Euclidean plane, the distance between two points in the plane depends on the path. The shortest distance is the straight line. But in a three-dimensional space, or sorry, four-dimensional space-time, uh, there will be different paths that will have different uh, generalized distance between them. And, and we'll find it, it becomes uh, slightly complicated in the sense that we have to distinguish between points that are what we want to call space-like separated and two events that are time-like separated. I think I, I'd be getting ahead of myself if I if I went into too much more detail. So I'm going to uh, wait until we, uh, uh, or I'm going to talk more about those in uh, detail later. Um, I guess here I just want to give you an overview of uh, you know the key events are going to. Um, or the, the key phenomena of special relativity are going to follow from this. Um, unfortunately, I can't see if that's one of you. Uh, no, it's a colleague has emailed me. 
Um, so, so that can wait. Uh, the uh, really what I was trying to say is that this idea that uh, clocks that are in relative motion have the appearance of slowing down. That's really just a phenomenon. The clocks don't really slow down. Okay, that they what happens is that you have shortcuts in space time. And it's, it's really just a result of this structure of this uh, four dimensional space time that, that you have these funny phenomena like clocks that appear to slow down and, and rulers that appear to uh, contract. You don't, it's not that moving rulers somehow shrink or, or moving clocks somehow uh, slow down or speed up relative to each other. It's, it's that you have uh, different paths through space time and, and they, they have different uh, uh, generalized distance. So this generalized distance is going to be a sort of uh, something that involves both uh, lengths and, and time intervals. So more on that later. Uh, there's some other phenomenon, mass and energy are, are linked uh, and, and there's a maximum speed uh, V. Let me just sort of give you an outline this idea of uh, mass and energy being linked. I, I can't do it in great detail, unfortunately. But um, not that it's too difficult. It's just that it's uh, uh, not our main uh, interest here. We have to use the result, but uh, I have to I have to cut where time is limited, so I have to cut things out, and, and that's one thing I decided to cut out. So, but I could just give you the result. It, it follows from uh, Newton's. Uh, fundamental law, force equals mass times acceleration, um, that worked in Galilean uh, iner in inertial reference frames. And it and it's, makes sense in, in the sense that the acceleration is independent of Galilean transformations. But this force equals mass times acceleration is not invariant under a Lorentz transformation. So we have to re rethink these, these notions of how forces and, and work and energy uh, are going to be related. If we had time to do a whole course on special relativity, then what I would have done is I would have, uh, we could have had the time to look at how, um, how this uh, forces uh, transform under the Lorentz transformation. And uh, this is what's done. I just have decided to give you uh, references on, on where you could find that material. I think my favorite is that done by Wolfgang Rindler in his textbook on, re it's called Relativity, uh, Special, General, and Cosmological. So he talks about uh, all, this, all the material of this class and uh, including black holes and, 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 and cosmology and the expansion of the universe. And he, he uh, does so in a, in a very accessible and uh, uh, but but rigorous way he he's uh, was trained as a mathematician and then worked as a in in relativity all his life he's still living as far as I know and uh, I exchanged emails with him a few years ago um, but he's quite senior uh, so that's my favorite presentation on it there's a much shorter presentation in this in an appendix of this quantum mechanics book. Um, as I say, I can't go into more detail because it's not our uh, main interest at the, uh, in this general relativity class. 
although we have to use the results uh, that um, the energy equals the Lorentz factor times the mass times the speed of light squared. So that's Einstein's famous formula. People often just say e equals mc squared. They're, they leave out the gamma for some reason. And one should notice that gamma approaches infinity as c as v approaches c that's because you get zero it, let me just scroll back and look at the definition of gamma is bam as beta approaches one its upper limit then the denominator here vanishes and or becomes vanishingly small and so you, you're approaching one over zero, so gamma approaches uh, infinity. Gamma lies between, between one and infinity, and it approaches infinity as beta approaches one or V approaches C. But that implies that this energy approaches the infinity because the, the M here is the rest mass, the mass associated with this particle when it's not moving. So that's always constant and, and C is just a constant. So the energy approaches infinity as V approaches C. And that's really all I can take the time to say about that. I need to introduce the notions of proper time and, and proper length. Actually, in this slide, I'll start with the, just the notion of uh, proper time or, or uh, it, you can think of it as a duration, a proper duration. It just means an interval in, in, in uh, or increment in proper time would be a, 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 a proper duration. So we're going to uh, go back to our standard configuration uh, with the two coordinate inertial reference frames, S prime and S uh, in relative motion with respect to each other, but, but now we're going to just add a clock at the origin of the S prime reference frame. And we're going to say that uh, because that clock is fixed at the origin of the S prime reference frame, then when we observe it in our S reference frame, we notice that it, it moves just like the origin of S prime. It, so it moves uh, some amount, say DL in a time period DT, that DL would be uh, V times DT. So working in the quadratic form, it would be this formula here. Uh, I want it squared because I want to look at this interval, what we call the interval of special relativity, defined as ds squared equals the speed of light squared times the interval in time squared minus the spatial uh, interval squared. But then because we know that L is dl is related to dt in this way, we can express dl in terms of dt and, and factor the d, dt and find ds squared equals uh, this uh, formula in terms of constants times dt squared. Now let's look at the same interval, the same spatial interval in the s reference frame, uh, sorry, s prime reference frame, the one in which the clock is stationary. Now the clock is stationary, so in some uh, interval time dt prime, it didn't move at all, uh, according to 
an observer in S prime, it just stayed at the origin. So, so the interval ds prime squared is just uh, c squared times uh, dt prime squared. Now I put a little, exceptionally, I put a little prime on the ds because uh, just to emphasize that that was the interval as we measured in the primed reference frame. However, because it's, uh, um, this interval is the same in all inertial reference frames, ds prime squared has to equal ds squared. So setting those two equal gives us that d prime equals uh, dt divided by gamma, again, this uh, Lorentz factor based on the the v, the velocity of the uh, clock as observed in the s reference frame. In the s prime reference frame, its velocity is zero. So in, in the s frame, its velocity is v. And from that v, you can calculate a gamma. And that's the gamma that goes here. So because gamma is always greater than or equal to one, you can, I just went through the reasoning why it, we said it was between one and, and infinity, right? In approaching infinity as, as uh, beta approached one, but its minimum value was, was uh, one. And so, um, think of what happens with this gamma here. Uh, it, 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 if, if, uh, if there's any relative motion at all, this gamma will be bigger than one. And, and, and so it'll make this equation shows that the T prime is less than or equal to uh, DT. So that's where that inequality comes from. And that's where this sort of phrase, which you've probably heard, uh, comes from, even if it's slightly misleading, it's useful as a memory aid. We say that clocks that are in movement uh, slow down, or at least they, we should say they, they would appear to slow down. Of course, they don't really slow down. It's just a, a result of uh, using uh, different inertial reference frames to, to describe them. And, and bearing in mind that time is, is a coordinate that transforms just like, uh, or in, in, in similar ways to the way uh, spatial coordinates transform under the Lorentz transformation. So, so because time is transforming under the Lorentz transformation, we, we have different uh, notions of what time are, and, and, and so we need different terminology to distinguish them. So the standard terminology is to call the time measured by a clock, which is uh, not moving, so in, the, the, in other words, the uh, coordinate time in which the, the object is, is not moving is called the proper time. So in this example, remember we put the clock in the S prime reference frame so in the S prime reference frame, it's the, the clock is stationary. So we say that the, the, uh, the time interval DT prime in this case is the proper time interval. So I'm going to replace DT prime with D tau, tau being the sim the Greek letter tau being the symbol for proper time. 
so I, to, to write this in a more general way, uh, the tau, the interval of proper time equals the coordinate time divided by gamma Um, because I'm a little bit, uh, normally I'd pause and, and have you work through this, uh, exercise for the TD, for the travaux dirigé today. I'd rather just, uh, pose that as a problem for you to look up later. So I'll send you via email the notes of this class and then you can uh, look up this exercise. The exercise is to uh, re a reminder on, on doing uh, rotations as we did in the, the math class. Uh, if we have two coordinate systems that are related, Cartesian coordinate systems that are related by a rotation you, you can find a matrix that, uh, the rotation matrix that relates the, the coordinates in the, in the two coordinate systems rotated relative to each other. And the reason I uh, want you to do that is to um, then do a similar thing uh, with the with the Lorentz transformation. Let's give you some exercise in using the Lorentz transformation. There's a result that's analogous to the time dilation, the, 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 the fact that the proper time interval gets uh, divided by this factor gamma or the, the proper time interval equals the, the increment in the time coordinate uh, divided by gamma. We have uh, that the, so in other words, moving clocks appear to slow down. We have a, another result in special relativity, which is that the lengths of rulers that are moving. A ruler is just a, like a meter stick. Uh, the length of a meter stick uh, seems to get uh, contracted or the length of a rod would seem to uh, get smaller as that rod is moving more quickly past us. Again, you can use the Lorentz transformation to to find the relevant formula. I'm going to leave that as an exercise for you to do. You can find an exercise like that in uh, Schutz's book and, and my uh, solution to it. Um, using a geometric argument, but it's most easily solved using the Lorentz transformation. I'll just give you the result. We, in fact, we went through this in the, in the math class, or sorry, in the relativity class uh, last year. So we have that a object that is not moving has a length L naught, L, like L with a little uh, subscript zero. I want to, in, in, in British English, they call that L naught. And uh, then in a, if you measured that same object, you would, in a reference frame in which it's moving, you would find that it has a length L prime and L prime is given by this formula 15 here of its proper length, L naught, divided by gamma. And what, so what's gamma? Well, gamma is the Lorentz factor based on the velocity V, where V of course is the velocity with which this object is, is moving. 
so you can a useful phrase to help you remember the sense of this formula is that you could say that a ruler or a meter stick that is moving appears to contract of course things don't really shrink uh, that that was a subtle point that confused uh, the early physicist uh, apparently Lorentz himself, even though this is called Lorentz contraction, he uh, he was so troubled by this that he he um, he thought there was some physical contraction that that actually went on instead of it being a result of uh, transforming uh, reference frames using his transfer the transformation named after him. So that's kind of uh, ironic. So I want you to try and derive this. I'm leaving that as an exercise for you, uh, is to derive this, this formula 15. I'm going to press on with the notion of uh, that, that the, we, we need some more tools from special relativity before we can develop general relativity. And a key, Thing that we need is the notion of uh, four vectors. So in, in French, uh, vector, and uh, so in English we just say four vectors. So let's go back to this equation four that we wrote earlier. We said that this interval in special relativity uh, had a special meaning because it, it was something that remained invariant under our Lorentz transformations. Remember we said that ds squared equals ds prime squared based on the invariance of this interval of special relativity under Lorentz transformations. It doesn't matter which inertial reference frame you you measure uh, the quantity delta s squared, you'll, you'll find the, the same value. Even though the, the intervals in the time and space coordinates change under the Lorentz transformation, the, the resulting ds squared uh, remain the same. You might say that this has the, a similar mathematical structure to what you would find in Euclidean, dyna, uh, Euclidean, Euclidean geometry, because in Euclidean geometry, we had a quantity delta L squared which is uh, given by just this spatial part here that was invariant under rotations of the coordinate systems in, in Euclidean geometry. Well, ds in, uh, squared in, in Euclidean geometry would be a squared distance. So this delta s squared in special relativity is like a generalized distance. That's what I was referring to earlier when I want to say that our intervals come in different types and, and we, I stopped myself because I was getting ahead of myself, but it, I was leading up to this point that we, we have this ds squared is a, is a t type of sort of generalized distance. It's, it's a distance, but with a, with a strange metric. See this, the, you could say that this d dl squared in Euclidean geometry is calculated with what's called the Euclidean metric. It, it, it's just a familiar idea that you take the you know, the increment in the x coordinate squared plus the increment in the y coordinate squared plus the increment of z coordinate squared. And, and that gives you the, the, the d 
distance between the, the two points that are separated by these spatial coordinates, that you're actually using what's called the Euclidean metric, the, the metric of Euclidean space, e even if we didn't use that terminology. Um, if you like, it, it's just a, 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 a name for the, uh, the geometry of, of, of Euclidean space is summarized in, in, in the quantity called the metric. And, um, <clears throat> but, but here in, in this geometry of, of uh, special relativity, it's Minkowski space by name, it's um, the, the, the metric coefficients include these minus one instead of plus one and a C squared instead of uh, one in front of, well, yeah, you could include the C in the T coordinate and then you just have a plus one here. Let me try and be more, uh, th that's the basic notion. Let me try and be more uh, formal in, in how I pr present it. So to present it more formally, I, I need a more compact uh, notation. So I'm going to replace my, um, my, my three spatial coordinates, x, y, and z with x1, x2, x3. This doesn't mean x squared or x cubed. It, it just means uh, I'm using an index to s keep track of the three different spatial coordinates, one, two, and three for, for x, y, and z. But then I need a, a fourth coordinate to refer to time multiplied by the speed of light to have the same units as the, the spatial coordinates. So I'm going to, as a standard practice is to use the index value zero for the time coordinate or temporal coordinate. Well, the advantage of using these indices to keep track of the different coordinates is I can have one symbol to indicate the coordinates x and then I just add a, another symbol, in fact, a Greek letter, here I've used the letter mu, to indicate uh, the different uh, coordinates. So the, the index mu can take on three, or sorry, uh, four different values, zero, one, two, or three, to, to indicate the, uh, or to refer to the different, uh, the, the four different coordinates. In fact, you can use any Greek letter, alpha, beta, gamma, delta, nu, mu. Uh, I recommend, some Greek letters uh, are, are, um, are better not used, although people do use them from time to time, but, but when you see pi and delta, you tend to think of other things, right? So you think of 3.14, et cetera, when you see the letter pi. So, so maybe if, if, if it can be avoided, it's better to just use alpha, beta, and mu, nu, lambda, gamma. Well, even gamma is used uh, for other things, but... Um, De time, from time to time, we're going to want to refer to just the spatial coordinates, so we're going to use the Latin letters, I, J, K, rather than Greek letters. It uh, being understood that I, J, K take on the values 1, 2, and 3 and just refer to the spatial values. Okay, we're now ready to talk about uh, or to introduce uh, four vectors. We have all the tools and notation. So, an event in four-dimensional space-time is something that takes place at a point in space with three spatial coordinates plus 
a time coordinate to indicate when it happened. So I can refer to its it coordinates in four dimensional space time in this way. But I can refer to that in turn with a very succinct notation, just X with an index mu. This is a, a position vector or a generalized position vector because it's a position in four dimensional space time. So I can write it as a column vector or uh, uh, the transpose of a row vector, the little T here uh, for transpose. Now, a four vector is a vector, is a collection of these four quantities that transform like the components transformed under the Lorentz transformation that we gave earlier. In fact, that's a definition of a four vector. A four vector is any collection of numbers that transforms uh, like the uh, position vector which that, that is to say the, the Lorentz transformation that we introduced earlier. Now a, a slight complication is that I have to distinguish between vectors that have what's called uh, contravariant components and covariant components. Um, and the, there's going to be I, I'm always going to write, write vectors just as a letter and then with an, a Greek letter index or an index in Greek letters. But the position of that index, whether it's, it's upstairs as I've drawn here or downstairs, uh, that's going to determine whether it's a, what's called a contravariant or a covariant vector. So there are two different types of vectors and in general and up till now in your education we've we've avoided uh distinguishing between those two types of vectors and just treated them all as if they were contravariant the problem is now we need to distinguish those from covariant vectors so i have to come clean and and and, and tell you that there are two types of vectors covariant contravariant and covariant and up till now, you've only seen the, the contravariant ones. Um, for the moment, I'm just going to deal with contravariant and define, for instance, the, the, the one of the most important four vectors that we use in, in relativity, in both special and general relativity, is the notion of the, the, the four velocity. So it's just a four vector defined in this way. If, if I took the four coordinates that describe the position and time of a particle moving in four dimensional space time, could be in, in four dimensional Minkowski space, then those four coordinates would change as time evolved. Now, as I mentioned earlier, we have to keep track of different types of time here because we have different notions of, of time. There was, for instance, the proper time um, measured by a clock that's not moving. Well, let's attack for, say we're describing a a particle moving through four dimensional space time, we could imagine attaching a, a tiny clock to that little particle. And then that clock would always be stationary with respect to the particle. It would have the same position as the, the particle and, and that would uh, remain unchanged. So with respect to the to an observer moving with the particle, 
he would say that the uh, clock is not moving, but then that clock should measure the proper time because that was the definition of proper time. Proper time was the time measured by a clock that's not moving, right? So let's write our spatial coordinates as a function of proper time measured by the clock moving with the particle. In other words, we're gonna parameterize the trajectory using the proper time measured by the uh, uh, clock moving with the particle. We, we talked about lots of parameterized curves in the math class with uh, Olivier and um, the, the parameterization in that class was just whatever was convenient to describe the curve. If it was a circle, we could have parameterized it with theta and then the, the, the x and y coordinates would be the radius times cosine of, of the angle and the y coordinate would be the uh, radius times the sine of, of the angle, right? So the angle there was the parameter we chose to describe that curve. Here I'm saying, let's be more strict in, in uh, or more restrictive in the parameter we use to parameterize our curve. Let's parameterize our curve with the proper time of a little clock that's uh, attached to the particle, moving along with it. And we'll call that, you know, following standard terminology, we'll write that time, that proper time as the, the Greek letter tau. And, but then we could take the derivative of the coordinates, both temporal and spatial here, the four different coordinates with respect to that proper time. That would give us the tangent vector, right? That's the tangent vector of this curve parameterized with proper time. And in fact, that tangent vector is the definition of the four vector that's the for velocity of this particle. You can see this explained uh, in detail in Schutz's book. In, in, uh, in fact, the whole chapter two is, is on uh, explaining four vectors in, in, uh, in great uh, De detail and, and quite uh, mathematically uh, rigorously so uh, even though but but presented for physicists not for for mathematicians Schutz is a is a physicist so I can uh, use this formula that we uh, introduced earlier and replace d tau with uh, dt divided by gamma. So I'll get uh, this formula here for uh, still the four velocity, definition of four velocity of some particle moving through four dimensional uh, space time. We're, st we're still in uh, flat space time of Minkowski here. But now I have the derivative of x naught with, or I have the derivative of these four coordinates with respect to t. But remember that x naught was just speed of light times t. So dt by dt is just one. So, so I have a uh, just one here as my first component. Now the whole thing is multiplied by gamma that came from this this formula here. So I have gamma times C as my first uh, component of this four velocity. Next component of the four velocity, well, that's just dx1 dt, but x1 was just another name for x. Uh, the, if, we're, if we're thinking of these spatial coordinates as x, y, and z. So I'm just writing them in more familiar terms here. 
it's more convenient to manipulate them in, in this index formation. But just to, uh, for, for once, I'm just, because this is new to you, I'm just re recalling what this means in more familiar terms. It's just x, y, and z here for x1, x2, x3. So d by dt of those spatial coordinates of the particle is just the, you know, the velocity in the x direction, the velocity in the y direction, and the velocity in the z direction. But now maybe I should be a little careful in what velocity I mean. I mean just the the normal, you know, Newton Newtonian or perhaps Galilean velocity, uh, just d by dt of of the the different spatial coordinates. So let's let's write that in symbols as vx, vy, vz, the traditional velocity with its three different Cartesian components, and all those get multiplied by gamma. Everything's multiplied by gamma here. So so that's our four velocity is just uh, for this particle in, in special relativity is just a gamma times c as the first component and then gamma times the uh, four velocity uh, sorry three uh, normal sort of uh, uh, Newtonian velocity uh, I, I guess I'm not sure what the to call it I in, in French I called it the 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 huge I tried to translate usual velocity um, but but here's its its definition here Oh, the, the, the church, uh, I live beside the church and it's telling me that I've just run out of time. And I know you have other uh, things to do. So I'm going to uh, terminate the, the lecture here. Uh, we didn't quite get done this first uh, introductory lecture, which is my fault because I was, uh, t t trying to figure out how to do this at distance. Uh, because of my car trouble. Um, so uh, I'm going to um, just give me one minute to explain uh, what we're going. I know you have to, to leave, but uh, um, l let me uh, maybe uh, explain uh, uh, I'm almost at a battery too. Uh, let me um, just say that uh, I, I'm going to uh, communicate with you by email, and um, and and we'll we'll continue the class uh, like this uh, next week uh, at distance. And um, but it's going to be important to uh, stay on top of the. Uh, to, to, to the the to travel dirige, um, which will be uh, which will be me helping you to uh, do the the, the control uh, continue uh, each week a, a, a new part of the control continue. Okay, so I'm going to email you uh, what the control continue will be. The part will be for for next week, and, and then and then uh, feel free to email me during the week if you need help. And then I'll, I'll help you uh, in, in, all together in the uh, end of in, in the uh, second part of the uh, of the hour uh, the two hours time slot next week. Okay, so have a good week. Uh, email me with any questions, and I'm looking forward to seeing you uh, at least uh, virtually uh, next week. Thank you.